where you are in the world. Thank you for joining us, Pranita. <laughs> oh, I'm so happy to be here. I'm just so honored, uh, especially to present with, in front of folks who've been working on these concepts for so long and who've worked on developing the concepts and I get a chance to come here and present. So that's really exciting. Well, the, the honor and the pleasure are all ours. So thank you for making the time. Um, and thank you. Thank you so much, Bill. Once again, I feel like we're leaning on you far too heavily. I guess it's right before retirement, right? So there you go. <laughs> That's, <laughs> you, right. You lose you. That's right. <laughs> lean, lean on me heavily until I break. And then I'll, <laughs> then I'll be gone. Oh, man. Um, no, I hope well, you still come around every so often after you retire. Seriously. <laughs> we love having you special um into the colloque series next monday on the 26th with harini um so we do hope that you're able to to join that because we will be awarding um actually two designations as senior research fellows um in the workshop community which is going to be really exciting and that's always a lot of fun so hope you can join us we'll do that at the end um of the session so that's that's coming up next week and remember that we are winding down also the research series um, though, you know, last but certainly not least here coming up this week um, and next with uh, Ian uh, from uh, from SPIA talking about alarm but unmoved. And then, of course, Jamie dun, 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 with musical style as an institution, which is going to be a wonderful way to wind up, wind up the year. So looking forward to that the next few weeks. Um, and thank you so much again, Pranita, for joining. It's so exciting. And uh, over to you, Bill, for a proper introduction. All right. Thanks, Scott. Hi, everybody. We're very happy to have as our colloquium presenter today, Professor Pranita Mudliar. Dr. Mudliar is assistant professor in the Department of Environmental Studies and Sciences at Ithaca College. And prior to that, she was a postdoctoral fellow in environmental justice and sustainability at the University of Denver. She received her PhD in environment and natural resources at Ohio State University, where her uh, Major professor was our longtime workshop colleague, Tom Kuntz. Um, professor Mudler's re research examines collective action under conditions of socioeconomic inequality and power asymmetries, especially in regard to the governance and management of shared resources. Her work has appeared in Environmental Science and Policy, Society and Natural Resources, Environmental Policy and Governance, and the International Journal of the Commons. Today, she shares with us some work on a decentralization reform in Tam Tanzania for the management of fishing along Lake Victoria and how and why that went badly. Um, please join me in welcoming Professor Pranita Modlier. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you so much for having me. As I said earlier, it's uh, I'm really honored to be here to present on concepts that people here have been working on for so long, uh, thinking about for so long and researching for so long. So it's certainly exciting to be presenting to such a gathering. And uh, so thank you everyone for making the time to come. And uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion after I finish my presentation. So I'll go ahead and share my screen now. <clears throat> Okay, it's visible, right? My screen? Perfect, all right. Uh, so as Bill mentioned, my name is Renita Mudiar. Uh, the title of my talk is When Promises Become Pathologies, Fragmentation in Tanzania's Lake Victoria's Polycentric Fishery System. So uh, this is just my outline for today. So pretty standard, I'll run through an intro, a quick lit review, uh, my framework, the methods, results, discussion, and I'll wrap it with my conclusion. Uh, so Lake Victoria's fisheries, uh, Lake Victoria shared by three countries, Uganda, Kenya, and Tanzania. Uh, this research is focused on a case study in Tanzania. So Tanzania shares 54% of Lake Victoria. And during the 1990s and in the 2000s, all three countries adopted a co-management approach to fisheries. So moving away from the centralized command and control. Uh, Tanzania adopted co-management in 1990s, and largely the justification was to facilitate power sharing between governments and fisher folks. So there was this context of devolution going on at the same time, uh, and that is when co-management reforms were also introduced, which gave rise to these multiple 
independent overlapping decision centers across different levels of governance. And these decision centers include central and local governments, uh, the co-management institutions, which are called as beach management units, BMUs, which consist of fisher folks and governments coordinating with each other to manage the lake fish fleet. Uh, so over time, the semi-autonomous coordinating decision centers with overlapping authority uh, started corresponding to a polycentric system. Uh, so during this time from the 1990s up to actually even today, co-management was expected to improve fisheries management and outcomes by increasing the compliance of fisher folks with regulations. But a lot of evidence has accumulated since the introduction of co-management that has largely been failing because of illegal fishing and overfishing uh, has been rising. And this is because of a fish called Nile perch, which was introduced by the British in 1954. And uh, it's a fish that is in high demand in the European Union, in the Middle East, in Brazil, uh, and also a little bit in the East Coast of the United States. So this demand for Nile perch has been fueling illegal and overfishing in Lake Victoria. Uh, so because, so in response to this illegal and overfishing on January 1st, 2018, Tanzania central government started Operation Sangara, which means Operation Nile perch, which, is, which was essentially a crackdown, a severe and a brutal crackdown on illegal fishing by seizing and burning uh, the fishing gear that took everyone by surprise. Uh, the lower level decision centers, which is the local governments, the county officers, the ward officers, the fishers, absolutely no one had any idea that this is what the central government is going to do. Uh, so this exclusion of lower level authorities from Operation Sangara started resembling a fragmented polycentric system, one in which coordination between higher and lower level authority uh, decision centers is uh, actively discouraged. So there was no coordination at all. So therefore, this study seeks to investigate how may interactions lead to the fragmentation of decision centers? What exactly happened that led to this particular outcome of the sudden shock to the system? Uh, so a little bit of review about uh, fragmented systems. So uh, previous literature tells us that fragmented systems with uh, are these isolated decision centers, right, which don't coordinate with each other, which leads to a loss of effectiveness and efficacy and ultimately leads to dysfunctionalities in the polycentric system. Uh, these fragmented systems also have unclear uh, or unestablished procedural rules. Uh, so people, decision centers usually don't really then know how to interact with each other, which then does not lead to produce any cooperative outcomes. Uh, but on the other hand, some scholars say that decision centers and fragmented systems can actually self-organize uh, to tackle cross-sectoral problems despite the fragmentation that is there, despite the isolation of decision centers. In fact, uh, Galaz et al. hypothesized that a polycentric order that is not subject to authoritative control, but one in which one which enables decision centers to self-organize and mutually adjust may emerge even in a polycentric uh, system that is fragmented. So, uh, but essentially, this kind of emergence of the polycentric order is predicated on building cooperative relationships and coordination, which itself is a challenge in polycentric systems. Uh, so, identifying. Uh, and rendering visible the interactions that drive fragmentation can shed light on the processes and conditions that ultimately lead to these dysfunctionalities in a polycentric system. Uh, so this study also responds to several calls by uh, scholars who have been studying polycentricity. So uh, several scholars have called for uh, a better examination or a more systematic analysis of the pathologies of a polycentric system uh, in different contexts as to help build more nuanced theory that explains uh, the promises and the pathologies in different contexts. So now coming to these interactions, uh, so in uh, Governing Complexity, the book, uh, Kunz et al. have laid out the different kinds of interactions in polycentric systems. So there's cooperation, uh, there's conflict, conflict resolution, and competition. And all of these are shaped by authority, information, and resources. So authority structures may hinder or incentivize cooperation. They can bring together multiple actors to participate together and share power in a cooperative setting. Uh, but authorities can also create conflict. So disputes can arise over who has appropriate authority to make decisions, especially when authorities overlap. 
uh, conflicts can also arise when there's inadequate authority or there's ambiguous authority or uh, rule misinterpretations by authorities, by power imbalances and so on. And similarly, authorities can also shape conflict resolution by bringing together conflicting parties uh, and to resolve the conflict. Uh, authority can also lead to competition. So competition to provide uh, and deliver the public goods to citizens may drive overlapping authorities to produce goods more efficiently. So similarly, like authority, even information shapes cooperation where uh, information sharing can help build relationships in multi-jurisdictional decision making. Uh, but then again, the lack of information or again, ambiguous information or misinterpretations can lead to conflict. Uh, and it may foster conflicts. And similarly, getting information, access to information can also shape conflict resolution. Uh, and similarly with resources, resource sharing and funding among decision centers can spur cooperation. Uh, lack of resources can create conflicts uh, and similarly with conflict resolution. Uh, and authority information and resources uh, shape uh, interact with each other to shape uh, competition. So uh, information and resource asymmetries can result in unfair competition. Uh, and sometimes in the context of scarce resources, citizens can be unduly burdened when overlapping authorities are competing with each other to raise revenue. So there are uh, different outcomes of these interactions. Uh, so in addition to these four interactions, scholars have also identified two other kinds of interaction. So one is coexistence, where decision centers complement one another without actually interacting with each other. And the other one is resistance, where decision centers resist the authority of other decision centers. Uh, so this is with my lit review. Um, and now moving on to uh, the theoretical framework. So I don't really need to talk a lot about this, but I'll quickly run through it. Um, so scholars have used uh, the institution analysis and development framework to examine how authority, information, and resources shape uh, cooperation, conflict, and conflict resolution and competition. Uh, and this has been done by Kuhn Satal again in the Governing Complexity book. So this study will focus on a key feature of the IED framework, that is these multiple levels of action, the constitutional, the collective, and the operational choice levels. Uh, the constitutional choice level is where actors constitute the decision-making body to collectively make rules and how those rules will be carried out. So an example of this is uh, the creation of policies and acts designed to establish power sharing and collaboration among higher and lower level decision centers. Uh, collective choice activities involve interactions among decision makers to identify, prioritize, plan, and strategize implementation of actions to improve social and environmental conditions. Uh, so these examples include decisions on how to allocate their organization's budget. Uh, and operation level activities include day-to-day -day activities of appropriation, provision, monitoring, and enforcement. So in the context of fisheries, uh, it can include enforcing regulations, performing technical studies, promoting best management practices among fishers, uh, conducting education, outreach, and awareness activities. So coming to my method, so I have uh, adopted a case study approach for answering this particular question. And I conducted semi-structured interviews and analyzed documents. So uh, I did 25 interviews across three landing sites in Tanzania. Uh, so with five local government officers, five central government officers, one county governor, uh, and there are scientists, fishers, and one focus group with fishers. Uh, and so documents I included all of the relevant policies that are there for analysis. Uh, so results, so just to remind everyone before I dive deeper into the results, so I'll be talking a lot about the different decision centers in, uh, in Tanzania's fishery system. Um, so at the central level, there is this Ministry of Livestock and Fisheries Development who is essentially in charge of forming a policy formulation. They make all the policy. Uh, at the county level, uh, it's the Ministry of Local Governments who is in charge who implements the fisheries regulation. So they essentially are in charge of implementing all of the policy that the central government makes. And then counties consist of a district, a district consists of a ward, and several villages make up a ward. Uh, and then there are these BMUs that I mentioned earlier, the beach management units that are these local organizations consisting of fishers as well as government officers. 
uh, they're limited to one village and sometimes a few villages. And these BMUs include absolutely anyone in fisheries. Uh, it could be fishers, it could be fish processors, fishmongers, traders, boat and net repairers, suppliers, boat builders, and so on. And uh, there's a committee in the BMU, which is made up of nine to 15 members elected from the local population. So now moving into my results. Um, so first I'll talk about the constitutional choice level. So here the analysis indicates that authority is largely vested with the central government to make policy. But the rules also say that uh, the central government, as well as the local government, can undertake policy implementation. So that results in an overlap. But the roles of both the officers are not clarified in the policy documents. Uh, so there is uh, this instance of uh, horizontal cooperation. So there's cooperation among policymakers at the central government to make policy. Uh, but the interaction between uh, the central and the local government is not clear given that the roles uh, and the functions and the responsibilities of uh, the higher and the lower decision centers are not clarified in the policy. There is one instance of a non-cooperative coexistence, which is uh, where at the local level, there are these BMUs and they too are constituted by elections, but uh, politicians interfere in the election. So these are shadow actors who are not mentioned in policy. Uh, but the politicians interfere in these elections by propping up their candidates. Uh, and these could be candidates who may be uh, engaging in illegal fishing. Uh, so I characterize this interaction as a non-cooperative coexistence, which means that there is essentially uh, no cooperation between the politicians, which is another decision center, and the BMU, which is the other decision center. But instead, the politicians undermine what the BMUs are trying to do by uh, interfering in the elections. Uh, so that is non-cooperative coexistence. And then uh, coming to information, there is horizontal cooperation. So again, this is within the central government. Uh, so there's information sharing uh, among the central government, but there's no information sharing rules uh, between the central and the lo lower governments, and essentially same for resources. So there are no rules uh, for sharing resources between uh, the central and the local government. Uh, collective choice. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, since the so the structure is that the uh, central government makes the policy and the local government implements policy. So that structure prevents both governments. Uh, working together to work on planning. So the central government essentially feels that the local government's planning is inadequate. And that creates a lot of conflict between them uh, because they cannot jump in and tell the local government what they need to be planning and how they need to be planning. They can just advise them with regard to policy, but they cannot plan with the central government. Uh, so uh, with regard to conflict, so one person, one interviewee said that the central government thinks that the local government is facilitating illegal fishing and that we are not good people. But if we come together, we can discuss and resolve these issues. Uh, but that hasn't happened until now, and I'll talk more about that later. Um, there are other kinds of conflicts between BMUs and village institutions at the local level. So again, this is a decision center that is not mentioned in uh, policy specifically with regard to what is the role of the village institution, uh, what is its function. But the, since the BMUs were essentially created in a top-down manner by the government, it didn't adequately take into account the local level village institutions that have already been existing. So the village institutions, which is the village council, feels uh, that its authority has been threatened because of the BMUs. They essentially feel that the BMUs have been created to take away uh, the existing functions of the village institutions. So that creates conflict between them where the village council then interferes with what the BMU is trying to plan uh, for its fishing activities. Uh, then there are non-cooperative coexistences shaped by authority here. So again, here BMUs are essentially again uh, uh, completely excluded from decision making with the local government and with the central government. Uh, so without being a part of the decision making body, uh, they don't really know or understand what exactly are they supposed to be doing for managing fisheries. So that again leads to a non-cooperative coexistence between them. Uh, there's also a non-cooperative coexistence between fishers and the politicians. So again, the politicians emerge here too to interfere with the planning that the fisheries officers 
uh, have are doing to manage the fisheries. Uh, and this does not lead to conflicts between them because the fisheries officers are too scared to call out the politicians uh, when they interfere in the planning because the politicians are so powerful and it seems like if they say anything, fisheries officers are immediately transferred to another location uh, by the politician. So it has not led to an open conflict, but just underlying resentment where again, both the politicians and the fisheries officers don't uh, cooperate with each other for managing fisheries. Uh, similarly, with information, there's conflict between the central and local government because there's no information sharing rules. So there's no information sharing happening between both the governments. Uh, and then there's also a lack of resources, uh, which uh, uh, where BMUs don't get enough resources from the central government or the local government does not get resources from the uh, central governments, essentially that leads to these decision centers just existing, but not being able to cooperate with each other. Uh, at the operational choice level, so here there are several conflicts. So uh, there are conflicts again between the central and the local governments because both also have different mandates for implementing policy. Uh, the central government is in charge of resource conservation, but the local government is in charge of revenue generation. So there are these overlaps uh, for policy implementation with regard to monitoring and enforcement or licensing, but because they just have so many just completely different mandates that again leads to conflicts between them on uh, when they undertake or, uh, enforcement. Uh, and, and there's another kind of conflict also because there is a perception that the central government is essentially conducting enforcement in the jurisdiction of the local government. So even though there is a functional and geographic overlap, the governments do not cooperate with each other for enforcement. Uh, other kinds of conflicts emerge because of the lack of clarity about who exactly has the authority to carry out enforcement. Uh, so because the roles and responsibilities are not defined, the fisheries officers who are on the landing site, the ward fisheries officers, don't really know from whom they're supposed to be taking their command. The BMUs don't know from whom they're supposed to be taking a command. So uh, the lack of authority leads to conflicts. Then there are conflicts again between BMUs and the fisheries officers because BMUs are now performing tasks that the fisheries officers once performed. Uh, so there is a perception among the fisheries officers that again, the BMUs have now taken over their task. So there is this perception of lack, uh, a lack of authority of the uh, fisheries officers. Uh, other kinds of conflict emerge because uh, between the BMUs and the fishers, where the fishers now perceive that the BMUs are an arm and an extension of the government, and uh, they don't follow any of the rules that the BMU uh, puts forth, especially with regard to monitoring and enforcement and reducing illegal and overfishing. Uh, conflicts because of uh, uh, lack of information sharing. So the central government doesn't inform the local government before conducting a patrol in their area. So Again, there is this feeling that authority is being undermined. Uh, and this is also where we see the first instance of uh, perverse cooperation. So this is, uh, I characterize this as perverse cooperation because it's cooperation among fishers to share information with each other to avoid getting caught by uh, fisheries officers and patrollers. Uh, so that is, and then for resources, uh, there's, uh, non-cooperative coexistences because again resources are deliberately withheld to prevent the inclusion of the local governments in enforcement. So essentially, again, uh, non-cooperative coexistences. So to address all of these uh, these instances of perverse cooperation, uh, there's corruption and illegalities in fishing, the conflicts, uh, these non-cooperative coexistences. The central government then started Operation Sangara by burning the boats and the legal fishing gear. And as I mentioned earlier, this, uh, this operation is only the mandate of the central government. So the central government has absolute oversight with no inclusion of the local government at all. So that leads to more instances of non-cooperative coexistences at uh, the operation choice level. And we also see that there is this instance of horizontal cooperation and that occurs only at the constitutional choice level. And then it occurs at the operational choice level. And this is solely with, because there's only cooperation among the central government authorities for implementing Operation Sangara. So what does this tell us overall? Uh, so we find that there are, uh, with regard to authority, 
its authority shapes six conflicts and six non-cooperative coexistences in total. Uh, with regard to information, there are two conflicts and three non-cooperative coexistences. And with regard to resources, there are five non-cooperative coexistences. So uh, in total, authority and resources shape most of the interactions of conflicts and non-cooperative coexistences between uh, the higher and the lower level decision centers. Uh, but authority also interacts with uh, information as well as with resources uh, to consolidate by deliberately withholding information and resources from lower level decision centers. So overall, authority, information, and resources create these non-cooperative coexistences and conflicts between higher and lower levels, and they shape cooperation among higher level decision centers to consolidate control at the center. So discussion. Um, so uh, Austin, Tibu, and Warren say that formal independence means that decision centers cannot do away with each other. Uh, so there is, uh, but over here I find that decision centers are not abolished, but the center is essentially controlling authority, information, and resources. And uh, the decision centers, the lower level decision centers are unable to undertake the tasks which leads to uh, the pathologies in the system. Uh, so previous research indicates that pathologies can lead to proposals to consolidate uh, a, a governance under a centralized authority, and Morrison uh, has found similar results in uh, the polycentric governance of the Great Barrier Reef, and she says that increased oversight of actors at the center without modifying existing arrangements and the potential for regime conversion as well as regime uh, realignment. Uh, so here I find that it's a centralized authority itself that is driving these decision centers. So the center is not just fragmenting the decision, lower level decision centers, but it's also consolidating control by shocking the system. Uh, and essentially it's transforming, it's preserving the polycentric system by, but transforming the system by dismantling all of the essential functions and cross-scale linkages and underusing existing provisions. Uh, so uh, other some scholars, so Paul Watson and Naipa Vasita, say that fragmented systems with no coordination are distinct from polycentric systems. Uh, but here I find that similar to Bidla and Bela, that fragmentation can also occur within polycentric systems. Uh, so there is this misalignment between institutions and the biophysical uh, environment that can occur even in polycentric systems that are fragmented. Uh, and it's largely with the driving force of the central government uh, creating these endogenous conditions that is leading to all of these dysfunctionalities that allows them to take over fisheries management. Uh, so to conclude, uh, some major contributions. So we see that at the constitutional choice level, there are these unintentional overlaps that emerge between decision centers because it's not clarified uh, in the rules. Uh, so and this leads to conflicts and non-cooperative coexistences. So in polycentric literature, uh, this emergence of overlap uh, because of that kind of ambiguous and overlapping authority, the deliberate disuse of authority, the legitimacy of authority, and the perceived lack of a perceived threat to authority is not yet well documented. And so this needs to be further scrutinized for their influence in shaping processes and outcomes. So this leads to a question as, to what are the different kinds of interactions that emerge as a result of such unintentional overlaps and what is the outcome of those interactions. Uh, another point, uh, the research identifies a new interaction, uh, non-cooperative coexistence. So uh, Jordan et al. define coexistence as where decision centers uh, coexist, but they don't interact with each other, but they complement here, or uh, they complement each other. So here I find that Decision centers are coexisting, but they're actively undermining each other, or they may not coordinate with each other by excluding them from participating or uh, uh, undermining their authority or excluding them, uh, not giving them information or not providing them with resources. Uh, so of course, this needs to be validated from other contexts, but I'll really be interested to hear about your thoughts about this particular interaction. Uh, and then what are other factors that could lead to these kinds of interactions? And what happens when decision centers uh, are engaged in the sort of non-cooperative coexistence and the interaction continues to fester? What comes after that? Uh, and what are other patterns of interactions that may fragment decision centers? Uh, lastly, so I find that 
in the presence of weak constitutional choice rules, interactions at the collective and operational choice levels are more effective at fragmenting decision centers. Uh, so the scholars have found that at, uh, interactions at the collective and the operational choice levels are more influential than others. Uh, so a question that comes then, so what is the impact of constitutional level rules and authority at the collective and operational levels to better understand how many rules and the exercise of those rules drive interactions? And a larger question that I am more interested in is uh, what kind of cascading adjustments are emerging now among decision centers in the aftermath of the shock to the system uh, through Operation Sangara? And then finally, uh, limitations of the study. Uh, so I just went to three landing sites uh, and snowball sampling also has its own limitation where actors not mentioned by interviewees would be excluded from my sample. Uh, but the research uh, confirms previous findings of a trend towards centralization uh, across East Africa uh, and Nunan, Fiona Nunan especially has worked a lot on this and has come to similar conclusions. Uh, but it also mirrors this worldwide trend towards centralization. Uh, but so what fund of recommendations can we make then uh, with regard to fisheries reform? So uh, Fiona Nunan again writes a lot about this and she says that it's, uh, this is something that is larger than the polycentric system itself. So there are these contextual conditions of the political regimes, there's rent seeking, there's militarized management, there are the shadow actors, the politicians not mentioned in policy who are even more influential than the fisheries actors. So uh, even if a polycentric structure emerges, with these contextual conditions, uh, the question is, will it still lead to the theorized benefits uh, and the polycentric functionality that is uh, being written about? So uh, maybe we need more institutions that take into account these contextual conditions and these system-wide interactions. Uh, so legally mandating collaboration could be one way to move forward. Uh, uh, because Operation Sangara is not a sustainable way to manage fisheries. And there's a big question mark on Operation Sangara right now because the president of Tanzania who authorized the operation passed away, uh, I think, early this month. Uh, so there's really no idea what is happening with the fisheries right now, given uh, the existing uh, uh, chaos already. Uh, and even if we need to develop information sharing, information sharing forums require resources, and this is already a resource scarce system. So uh, in, in the scramble for more resources, so chasing scarce resources could cause organizations to develop even more uh, reconcilable differences amongst them. Um, so to conclude, so regardless of the type of governance model for Lake Victoria fisheries, uh, I think the research says that so unless these contextual conditions are addressed, polycentricity will just continue existing as a shell and a structure without being able to realize its promised benefits, uh, which will then lead to even more pathologies in this particular context. Uh, All right. So Sounds like a good is. place to go to questions. Pranita, thank you very much. A reminder to everybody, um, who is with us today that our usual protocol is uh, I will manage the, uh, the queue of questions and answers and you can signal that you have a question either by using the raise hand function after you click on the participants button at the bottom of the screen or by typing into the chat and uh, you don't have to type out your whole question. You can just type, I have a question, and I will happily call on you. Um, and so the, the queue is open. And um, Pranita, while people are formulating their uh, questions, I'm just going to ask um, a quick question, because obviously this, this, uh, this sudden crackdown on um, illegal fishing is, as you say, this sort of um, uh, almost traumatic uh, shock to the system. And this may sound like a really dumb question, but I, I, I just wanted to make sure I understood. Who's, what made the fishing illegal? Uh, uh... So the fishing is illegal because they've been using uh, nets, uh, 
Beat Sainnet essentially, whose right. width is larger than the legally mandated uh, regulation, which is like six inches. Uh, and then fishers have been stitching together different fishing nets, uh, mosquito nets, and using that for uh, fishing. So that essentially makes it illegal fishing. And then also using a boat, which is more than 11 meters in size. Okay. Uh, and, yeah. So the regulations or laws that make those fishing technologies illegal are central or local? Yes, central. Okay, great, thank you. All right, I already have Jamie and Derek in the queue. So Jamie, you are up first. All right, thank you so much for your talk. And it was really cool to see the level of detail to which we've, you've thought about all of these complicated issues. I think I have a question that follows up on Bill's, which is, so if, if this enforcement of, of illegal fishing was a shock to the system, uh, I guess, did was this illegal fishing sort of allowed to happen like un you know unenforced i mean you know without being like enforced for like a long time mm -hmm. that's really uh, great question so yes it's been happening for a really really long time and uh, i think this is where that concept of perverse cooperation comes in because there is this unsaid understanding amongst local fishers bmus that uh as long as you give me some money, I will, you know, turn the other way and allow you to illegally fish. And this becomes especially very important, especially with the BMUs, because they are being asked to monitor and enforce these regulations against their own family members and relatives. And they can't really do that because that would be breaking the family ties. So that is why they too turn the blind eye. So they'll just inform them that, look, there's a patrolling uh, boat that is going to come out in a few hours, so you better not be illegally fishing at that point of time. So this, uh, and then there are these politicians too who allow illegal fishing uh, again in exchange for money. So that's the friend-seeking part, and this is something that is uh, systemic throughout, like right from the local level up till the central level. And in fact, the uh, president of Tanzania too allowed and encouraged illegal fishing for a long time because that is also a vote bank for uh, them. And this is not just with, you know, specific to Tanzania, but also in Uganda, also in uh, uh, Kenya. And in fact, in Uganda, uh, the military started coming in to enforce regulations. Uh, and all the BMUs and the decision centers at the lower levels were completely dismantled. So over there, it was like the next step completely where even the existing structure is being dismantled. Mm. Wow, I actually have just a sec before we, we turn, I have a, a follow up thought too, because you mentioned like in information sharing. And so I actually really kind of read an interesting chapter um, by San Filippo Frischman and, and Strandberg um, on privacy and, and knowledge commons, this idea that when you share information, you're not necessarily revealing everything, you're only revealing what's necessary for the situation. So that might be an interesting thread to follow as you continue developing this work. Um, and I'll put, I'll put the chat during the chat. Oh, sounds good. Yeah, I would definitely like to look it up to see to what extent that idea is mirrored in the data that I have. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, Derek, you're up next. Hey, Pranita. Thank you for the presentation. How are you? Um, so so I, I appreciate that you pointed out that um, polycentric systems, <laughs> there's, there's a, a lot of literature that suggests that polycentric systems don't necessarily align very well. And there's, there's always these aspects that are both rent seeking and shadow actors, and even just the, the ability of some of these actors to have implicit power. We certainly see that with water in the West who comes to the table and everybody knows who actually makes those allocation decisions. Um, it's just a little more explicit in the cases you're looking at because the formal systems are kind of pathological as well. That there's this political rent seeking that's very upfront and that there's real political benefits that you get from ignoring rules until it doesn't. And then you change and you enforce everything. And then the next day you kind of miss it. So I'm, I kind of want you to step back and say what, if we want to take your insights here and apply them to other polycentric systems around the world, what do you think are the things that are most important to look forward to move the literature forward? 
I mean, I'm, I, I can just think of all kinds of analogies in the work on poaching and wildlife conservation, on um, forestry, certainly, where you get these kind of waves of enforcement on some of the stuff we're starting to do on, um, on data and information access, where, the, where there's these implicit actors there that we know kind of control the system to begin with. And we haven't, I don't think, captured those very well um, explicitly in the way that you are. And I'll yeah. you can let you reply. Thank you for that, Derek. Uh, so I think, uh, maybe looking at the political regimes in which these polycentric systems are emerging would be one way to begin. Uh, especially here, like with all three countries, Tanzania, Uganda, and, uh, uh, and uh, Kenya, all are democratic, but they're like pseudo-democratic. Uh, and Uganda is like more authoritarian than comes Tanzania, and then uh, Kenya where democratic institutions are stronger. Uh, and I think that determines then what kind of powers that these actors have in the system, uh, what kind of powers do shadow actors have. And even though all three countries are at different places with regard to the political regimes, the role uh, shadow actors essentially have the same kind of role and function in all three systems. They're not mentioned in policy, but they're really powerful uh, because it's a powerful vote bank. And I think the role of shadow actors especially has not been, uh, it's still scant and there's a lot of opportunity to uh, uh, evaluate. So how do they emerge? Where exactly do they emerge? At what point do they emerge? Uh, and what kind of outcomes uh, does it result in? Because shadow actors can also play a beneficial role in the system. Like we see that with nonprofits who can fill in gaps uh, in information sharing or in resource sharing. Uh, and I think shadow actors then also, I think, ties along with uh, the kind of rent seeking at least uh, we see here. And with regard to what you mentioned about the implicit power, I think there's scholarship that's emerging on different kinds of power dynamics amongst different levels of governance, these decision centers who are at different levels. So I think there's a huge potential uh, to take, uh, this is a work from Tiffany Morrison, who's been looking at these uh, uh, framing power, so the power which is there in the constitutional rules, uh, pragmatic power, how that power is actually implemented, uh, and uh, uh, which is the other, and framing power as to how, so issue framing basically. So what kind of language is used in order to uh, uh, wield or turn certain outcomes to your benefit. So I think uh, starting out with the political regimes and then looking at, so how does that regime influence what kind of role and function and power that the actors in the system have to be one place to begin. And I think there's also uh, an opportunity to look at the overlaps. Uh, so because overlaps is essentially one of the key features of polycentric systems, uh, which is supposed to lead to coordination uh, and all of that and lead to improved outcomes, uh, social and environmental conditions. But here, I don't see that happening. The data doesn't show that happening because it's leading to conflict. Uh, in another uh, case study that I've just started doing, in uh, looking at the Bangalore context, it looks like there are overlaps among decision centers, but that leads to passing the buck. So essentially, no decision center wants to take the responsibility for uh, providing a certain service to its people. So uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity to unpack what exactly the role of overlap, how do they emerge, uh, and what happens after that, uh, and what happens to the interactions after that. Thank you very much. I'm going to turn to Ben. Uh, the queue is open after that. So if you have a, a question, uh, just let me know. Either raise your hand or type in the chat. OK, thank you. Lots of interesting things going on. I managed to read part, but not all of the paper. Um, so I guess part of what I'm curious to understand, to what extent is there actually local interest and support by the fishers or other stakeholders in fisheries to better provide collective goods? Or is this all just kind of technocratic top-down things that you know, people above and you know, scientists and whoever think should be done? So in connection to that, but I might be guessing wrong, you do say there was some success in controlling use of dynamite and poison. So what was going on there that that actually has met some success in contrast to the rest of what you talked about. And again, are there some other things that would actually be collective goods that 
you know, local stakeholders would like to provide. Mm -hmm. So uh, thank you, Brian. So to answer your first question, uh, with regard to interest among local actors, uh, they talk about just, you know, wanting more resources because there's some BMUs just exist. Uh, they don't do anything at all. And the so one biggest reason is they don't really know what needs to be done because the BMUs were propped up by the government. And there's a quote in the paper that I think I remember that says that the government just came and told us that you'll need to put in BMUs. And if you don't create a BMU, you will essentially be demarcated as an illegal fisher. Uh, so that was the only information that they got. And uh, for the first three years, so this was funded when BMU first came about, it was funded by uh, uh, EU Lake Victoria's uh, environmental management program. Uh, so there was a lot of funding in the first three years. So that led to capacity building. It led to a lot of resources. It led to a lot of information. But after the funding died out, the government could not uh, maintain that same source of funding. Uh, so now BMUs have to patrol fish, uh, the lake body, but they don't have resources to do that because they're supposed to do that voluntarily. So they're supposed to take their own boat, uh, their own fuel. They have to pay for their uh, own fuel. They have to pay for their own food. They have to find a boat crew to come with them for the patrolling, and they have to pay their boat crew too. So they don't have the money to do that. If at all, if any money comes in, that is when they go out to uh, patrol. But uh, so they can't carry out the patrolling activities at all. Uh, so uh, in my interviews, uh, get, me, just being a part of the decision making. Uh, was something that local fishers mentioned, uh, but most of them spoke about wanting capacity building because once uh, a chairperson, a secretary, and a treasurer are elected to the BMU committees, they have no idea what's the role of a chairperson. So capacity building with regard to maintaining accounts, maintaining the funds, and all of that. So that also hasn't been done. Uh, and then they spoke a lot about the conflicts with the village institutions that I mentioned earlier. The, uh, the central government has uh, not stepped in to resolve these conflicts, even though the rules say that they're authorized to resolve conflicts uh, amongst lower level decision centers. But so these conflicts between BMUs and the village councils have just been festering since the time the BMUs have emerged and they continue even today. Uh, so that is with regard to uh, uh, interest among local actors. And I, I forgot the second part of your question. So could you just help me out again? OK. Uh, OK, again, on the theoretical level, the question is, are there some collective goods that fishery fishers or other fishery stakeholders really would like to work together um, to provide? Or maybe already providing in terms of you know some rights over fishing zones and so on that go in other places, you know, local rules mm -hmm. that people actually are implementing that maybe are somehow taken for granted. And then just from the paper, curious, because you do mention that there was some success or some change, mm -hmm. better control over ah. the use of dynamite and poisoning. So why was that different? Are there other things okay. that local people are providing or would actually like to provide, not just what somebody else is coming and telling them should mm -hmm. be provided? Right. Uh, so with regard to provision, so why it was successful, the dynamite and poisoning was because that came back and so essentially most of the factories, all of them just shut down. And because the fish was not being accepted by the European Union, it was not being accepted by the Middle East. Uh, so that led to all of the fishing factories shutting down. And then I think all of them lobbied to uh, get the government to uh, talk with the fishers. So, and I think the fishing dynamite and poisoning thing happened uh, when the BMUs were starting to be propped up. So I think with regard to the capacity building that happened in the first three years, they could work with the fishers uh, to uh, sensitize them and create awareness about the follies of using poison and as well as dynamite for fishing. Uh, so, uh, and currently right now, interest in providing any sort of other collective goods. So Lake Victoria fishing is completely open access right now. Uh, so at least in these interviews, uh, there didn't seem to be any other rules as to who can be a fisher. Anyone can be a fisher as long as they go to the BMU and say that I want to be a fisher and then they're registered. So there's really no limit. There are no rules about where you can fish and how much you can fish. 
so right now it's mostly being focused uh, the crackdown is being focused only on the illegal fishing part so that fishers don't end up catching juvenile fishes so uh, that is the scenario right now. thank you all right <clears throat> So we have a, a, a few additional minutes and I'm gonna um, ask a question and, um, and then if anybody else has one, just signal me. But the question I have for you, Pranita, um, you have been describing, and I, I think this may just be the, what you were talking about is non-cooperative coexistence, uh, which is an important um, concept to bring into the discussion. And as you were describing how some of the decision centers in this case have interacted and failed to interact, I had the question of when decision maker, when decision centers are failing to coordinate or even thwarting each other's um, efforts, what happens to those conflicts, they sound like conflicts to me anyway, what happens to those conflicts and, and, and why? If nothing happens, why does nothing happen? If, if something does happen, but it seems to be unsuccessful, why is that? Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I'm thinking of an example, uh, so maybe it'll come to me, but when there's this uh, non-cooperation coexistence happening. So basically it's just decision centers uh, continuing to coexist. So the central government does its enforcement by itself in the local government's jurisdiction. At the same time, the local government is also doing its own enforcement in that same area. So uh, at, that is where I see that there is this, you know, both of them are in the same place. So there is a functional overlap and there's a geographic overlap happening, but there's no coordination happening between them. Uh, they may end up talking with each other when they're on the lake. Uh, so that could be some kind of interaction that happens, but they don't share information with each other that maybe uh, this is a area that you need to keep an eye on, or these are some fishers that we have found. So they don't share that information. And even though they are in the same jurisdiction and interviewees say this, it's actually more beneficial for local authorities to conduct the enforcement because they are the ones who are at the uh, who are at the landing site and they have a pretty good idea of what is going on, but they don't have the resources because the resources come from the central government. So without any resources, the local governments uh, cannot even go out for patrolling. So if any patrolling happens by the local governments, it's very rare. Uh, so that is how what I mean by the non-cooperative coexistence. So they're essentially at the same place, but they're not coordinating with each other. And it's not only because of a lack of resources, but the central government is actively prevented uh, from coordinating with the local government. Uh, they deliberately exclude the local government from, uh, and this, is, this especially is for true for Operation Sangara, where uh, they're completely excluded from implementing any of the uh, uh, enforcement operations of the uh, operations on that. Thank you. That helps. Um, that helps me understand. Um, Divya has the next question. Divya, go ahead. Hi, hi, Pranita. It is so nice hi, to uh, <laughs> so nice to uh, hear your talk. And uh, yeah, it was so enlightening and so illuminating to just sort of like you know see the way you unpacked a super complex, super complex process. And while I was listening to your talk, you know, I just couldn't help but think about the context of uh, Forest Rights Act in the uh, in Indian context. And, uh, and one of the things that we have seen is that, you know, uh, just uh, even though uh, these, these local institutions or local level bodies, they are aware of their rights uh, which again, you know, there, there's a lot of work that has to be done uh, in that respect. But what we've seen is that, like, you know, the fact that they're able to assert their rights or assert, you know, uh, uh, what they what they really deserve, like in terms of resources, what they're like really entitled to, that makes a lot of difference. So, uh, and I know this is a really nice question, but I'm wondering, like, you know, in your uh, in your research, do you think that you know that awareness about the resources that the BMUs should have and their ability to be able to assert 
you know, and, and demand for those resources. Do you think that would make any difference? Um, that's a really good question. Thank you, Divya. Uh, and to be honest, I don't know. Uh, simply because I think the resource system itself is so different, right? Like on one hand, we have the forest where you can sort of see the boundary of the resource. Uh, so you can you can see the physical dimensions of the resource, right? And you can see the trees, but here with fisheries, it's so different, right? Like fishers sort of have an understanding about the uh, amount of fish in their landing sites, but in the interviews, everyone had different views about whether the fishing, the fish population is going down or up. Uh, and I didn't really bring up the point about uh, asserting rights. So there have been talks about uh, giving rights to fishers with regard to creating aquaculture zones in Lake Victoria. Uh, and that has brought up even more uh, questions here about, so does that mean that fishers who don't want to participate in aquaculture, what would happen to their landing site? Will they still have access to that landing site? So the, uh, the question of rights has come up in that particular context. Uh, and uh, Kenya and Uganda going forward with aquaculture, not so with much with Tanzania, because uh, once this idea of rights started coming in with regard to aquaculture, it also meant that so is that going to lead to the privatization of the landing sites? Uh, so over there it has been stalled, uh, but that's that's the context in which uh, this question of rights has been uh, coming about. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thank you. Um, I think this is probably as close to the top of the hour as we'll get unless we fit another question in at this point. So I'm gonna um, A, uh, remind people that Pranita has agreed to stay on for a little while. So if you have additional questions or want to engage in additional conversation, that opportunity uh, will begin here in just a minute. But otherwise we'll call this uh, formally adjourned. And so please join me in thanking Pranita for this uh, really excellent case study and all the um, theoretical implications that it holds for our work. Um, Scott, any uh, uh, parting thoughts? Just that that was brilliant, Pranita. <laughs> so echoing Eric there in the chat, thank you. That was so, so very well done. Um, and thank you for agreeing to stay on for a little bit so that we can continue the discussion. It's fantastic. No, and so thank you, thank you. Thanks, Bill. Thanks for the wonderful moderating as always. And, oh. and hope you all have such a, such a wonderful, those who do need to jump off um, afternoon. As a quick reminder, we have our research series uh, just for this Wednesday and next. So please, uh, uh, please do join in if you have a chance and look forward to seeing you all on Wednesday, um, if not before, but I, I'm staying on. So thank you, Pranita. This is great. <laughs> all right. All right, thanks. Um, now this is more like the 